Welcome to this evening's webinar, Eco Retrofit for Householders, Unit 1, Understanding Retrofit. Um, I'm delighted to have our expert speaker, Marianne Heaslip of Urbed with us this evening. And um, really pleased that she's going to be giving this introduction for you today. So in terms of our timings this evening, I'll give a short introduction um, and hand over to Marianne at about 10 past six. She'll give her presentation and then we'll have about 30 minutes left for questions. So do, if you've got questions that come up as you're thinking and listening, do put them into the Q&A and we'll deal with them at the end, allowing about 30 minutes to answer all of your questions. And then when we've come to an end of the questions, hopefully I'll do a second poll um, and run through some next events and, and wrap up. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Cumbria Action for Sustainability already, um, our vision is Zero Carbon Cumbria, we co-chair the Zero Carbon Cumbria Partnership, and within that we, we run a lot of different projects, not just retrofit, not just green buildings, um, not just renewables, There's a lot of different community projects, business projects, and, and projects with individuals. So do go on our website and take a look and get an idea of what it is we do. I work within the energy services team and we have we do a, a range of things there. So on the free side, we run um, our Cold to Cozy Homes Cumbria service um, and we can also offer a, a general advice phone call on specific questions such as should I have PEV or what kind, you know, something about external wall insulation versus internal wall insulation. So sort of fairly specific questions. We can answer those if you give us a call. Um, on the Cold to Cozy Homes number and also for those people who've got a, a, a retrofit in mind in the short term or the longer term and you're looking at your house holistically then you can also get a free retrofit phone consultation um, as well and you can just do that by phoning up Cold to Cozy Homes number and, and you'll probably be put through to me. Uh, on the other side of things we do our paid for services so the Home Retrofit Planner is our audit advice energy audit advice service um, and we also offer, can offer thermal imaging in the winter and other kinds of, of, of advice as well. So that's our paid for services and then on top of that we run courses and webinars like this one for time to time. We're fortunate that we can offer this webinar for free because it's funded by a project uh, funded by Energy Redress but we're always really pleased when people give us donations because it means that we can take our work further, we can do more with it. So thank you to those of you who do, who've done that when, when you booked on. So Marianne, um, it, we're really lucky to have Marianne um, speaking to us this evening. She is the Technical Director at People Powered Retrofit in Manchester and the Associate Principal at Urbed, um, which she might say um, a wee bit more about that when she starts, that's great. And so Marianne, as an architect, has been working on retrofit projects um, and tools to help support retrofit for, for quite a while now. Um, and it's really been very central to working on the Home Retrofit Planner, which is the product that CAFS uses when people want an energy audit and, and all sorts of other projects, not just individual houses as well, sometimes working on social housing um, and working at scale. So really um, diverse range of buildings and expertise in retrofit. So without further ado, Marianne, over to you. Okay, well, um, thank you very much, Tina, and uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I will just share my screen uh, in place of Tina's now for a moment. Um, so yeah, as Tina said, I've, I've spent a lot of time um, working on retrofit most of the last decade i've been working on retrofit in various different forms um and when you're working across either individual owner occupiers or uh bigger kind of social housing schemes or looking at the tools um that help you make decisions around retrofit there's some things that stay common throughout all of that um, i think that's we're going to be talking a little bit about the kind of the theory 
a bit? Are they, the approaches that are important when you're starting to think about retrofit? Because the really key thing is to try and get your brief right and understand what you're trying to achieve straight right from the off. Because um, it's really easy with retrofit to uh, to get kind of distracted or drawn off down a, a track because there's a, a really lovely shiny bit of kit that you'd like to use, but you need to understand how that fits into what you're trying to achieve overall. Um, so yeah, I think we've we've kind of done introductions. Uh, I should say, so I, I do wear two hats. I'm technical director at People Powered Retrofit, which is a end-to-end uh, -end service for householders, but also has some of those other things like home retrofit planner in development. That's focused on owner occupiers, largely in, in Greater Manchester. And the other uh, side of things at, at Urbed, that's where we do a lot of our kind of public and community projects. So that's the, the bigger scale stuff. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is, is really some of the really the, the key principles that it's useful for you to understand when you're starting to think about retrofit. Really big one is whole house approach, but then we'll go into what that means for each of those different aspects when we're talking about heat, um, <clears throat> ventilation, moisture. Um, and we'll try, uh, we will just be kind of introducing these concepts and maybe skimming across the top of some of them, but hopefully it gives you enough that when the next sessions come on, you can dig into them in a bit more depth or you can go and, you know, we can point you at, at other resources as well if you want to do a bit more of your own learning. But hopefully this will be enough so that you can start to ask um, some of the questions to make sure that you're getting retrofit right for you. Uh, so yeah, that's People Powered Retrofit, which I've already mentioned, but I should say it's an organisation that's come out of a collaboration between Urbed and Carbon Co-op, which is another um, a cooperative that some of you might have heard of uh, that's also based in Manchester. But as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm not from Manchester, I'm actually from working, so a few of you might have worked that out already. Um, okay, so without further ado, because we're... Uh, Want to get through a fair bit in the next uh, 40 50 minutes or so. I'm going to talk about the whole house approach. Um, you'll hear a lot about this in retrofit. What it's important to understand is that it doesn't necessarily mean that when you're doing a retrofit, you have to treat the whole house at once. It's really about uh, a way of thinking about your home um, and understanding that it's a system. So houses are dynamic systems uh, and there are several different systems that interact within them. The first one that's probably the easiest to understand is the fabric of the building. So that's the, the walls, the floors, uh, the roof, the doors, the windows, uh, and thinking about how heat is generally in our climate lost through those. And that, that's an important consideration. Um, then there's ventilation because you also want fresh air. Uh, you want a good uh, internal environment. Um, then often in our climate, again, because without uh, putting extra energy in your house for a lot of the year, probably won't be very comfortable. So you'll often have a, a heating system of some form as well that's putting heat into your house. And then there's also lighting and appliances. <clears throat> so all of your uh, kind of kitchen equipment, fridges and freezers, all of your lighting, that all has an impact on, on how the house behaves. Um, and then there's also people. So how, how all of these systems work and how they interact with each other really depends on uh, how the people within the house behave a lot of the time as well, which is sounds complex, but really it's very simple things like what setting do they have their thermostat at, um, how often are they in the house? Are they in the house during the day or not? All of these things have to be kind of considered when you're looking at what your brief for a retrofit is. Uh, and yeah, as I said, all of these systems interact as well. So your ventilation system will interact with your heating system, will interact with your windows and doors, depending on whether they're open or closed or whatever. Um, <clears throat> I think it's really important to understand that, as I've said, the houses are quite complex systems. So some of you might live in houses that were built over a, a number of years, maybe in, in phases over centuries. 
Um, what we try to do is take a very context specific and a, a risk management approach. So that, that doesn't mean that you never do anything. It means that you understand what you're doing and, and what the potential impacts of that might be. Um, because I'm sure some of you might be aware if, if you get things wrong when it comes to moisture or air movement, that's when you can have uh, problems when it comes to um, condensation or damp or mold or those kinds of things, which can exist in an unretrofitted house as well. And it, there's still a sign that something somewhere has gone slightly wrong. Uh, what you don't want to do though is spend money on retrofit that makes things worse. So when you are adding insulation or you're changing the ventilation system or you're improving the air tightness it's really important to understand how those new things are going to fit within your existing context um, so that you're not creating unintended consequences um, this is a really useful tool um, that doesn't necessarily tell you the answers uh, but it's a good way of, of understanding what some of the interactions might be it's the responsible retrofit um, or the retrofit wheel that was developed by the Sustainable Traditional Buildings Alliance. I'd really recommend having a look on that, that web link, um, maybe having a play with some of the things that you're thinking of doing and just seeing what the interactions are. So this, it's a very interactive tool um, and it'll, it'll help you understand what some of the things are that you need to look out for. Um, I think the other thing that we say is important because you're trying to understand these different interacting systems when you're uh, thinking about what you might do to improve your home. So usually you might be adding some insulation or changing the ventilation system or improving air tightness. It's really important to make a plan of what order you're going to do those things in. And that's whether you're doing them all in one go as part of a big refurbishment project or if you're doing them phased over time as you've got money available or you can live with the disruption if you have a plan from the outset that uh, helps you understand how they all fit together it means that you don't end up having to uh, undo something that you've done um, and you also understand how how things might fit together so an example might be if you want to fit new indoors and you also want external wall insulation uh, it's a good idea if you can do both of those things at the same time because it helps you make the connection between them um, properly and well. But if you can't, then it's worth thinking about actually, am I going to have enough room to insulate against these new window frames so that you can come along and do it later if, if that's what you plan to do. So it just takes a little bit of uh, planning and thinking about. Uh, the report, the handbook there is quite useful. It, it does talk about passive house levels of retrofit, which isn't necessarily what everyone's going to, but it gives some useful pointers about uh, which sets of measures might go together quite well and what order it might be useful to do things in, uh, which can be affected by your brief as well. So, uh, you know, if comfort's more important to you, then you're probably going to prioritise uh, some of the fabric things. Uh, if carbon is more carbon emissions reductions are more important, you might do some fabric and then change over the heating system more quickly, uh, which is kind of what the energy hierarchy, as we call it, is about as well. So we we talk about reducing the need for energy use first, uh, because well, I don't know if you've ever heard the term megawatts, but people talk about the cheapest kilowatt hour of energy or the most effective kilowatt hour of energy if it comes to um, reducing our environmental impacts is the kilowatt hour that you don't use. So, but that also has some added benefits around, uh, it usually helps your house be more comfortable because you're losing less heat, you've got fewer drafts, you've got fewer cold spots. So you, you're kind of making the fabric work better. Um, <clears throat> that then, means that when you put new building systems into the house or so heating, lighting, ventilation, they can be sized properly for that level of demand and they're able to use energy more efficiently as well. And then the last thing that we normally recommend that people do, although sometimes it is the first thing that people do, uh, but things like solar panels should generation, which are kind of uh, they're useful to have and they top things up and they can save you a little bit of money on your bills, 
but they're not going to make the same level of, of impact as, as the first two steps. Um, so yeah, we do it this way for a lot of different reasons, but it's, it's largely about thinking through that whole house approach, being able to have more effective and efficient building systems, uh, being able to have lower maintenance and um, avoiding basically spending money on lots of shiny things uh, that then might not work as well as you'd hope they would. Uh, we use the term eco bling, but you're trying to look at what's the most effective and efficient way of using energy in the home that gets you comfortable and gets you good indoor air quality and all the rest of it. Um, and also that future proofs you. Um, <clears throat> so, and, and reduces fuel poverty. So I know there's kind of a lot of chatter about the moment uh, about heat pumps, and I'm a massive fan of heat pumps. I think they're a really good idea and we should definitely do them. But because of the price uh, of gas versus the price of electricity at the moment, especially if your aim in retrofitting is to reduce your bills or to tackle fuel poverty, then you're gonna have to tackle the fabric. Um, not just change over your heating source because if you change a gas boiler for a heat pump it's probably going to cost you about the same to run um and then that yeah that future proofing of homes um the more that we insulate homes uh the more that they retain heat the more that we're able to use them as part of the overall energy system as well so you can start to do a little bit of demand shifting because if your house doesn't lose lots of energy it means you're more able to say, hang on a minute, I'll wait and I'll put my heating on when I know there's a cheaper energy or when the, <coughs> when the grid is uh, lower carbon. Uh, easy reproach meeting, target CO2 rating savings. It can be sometimes, most of the time, not always. It really does. I mean, it goes back to that first point. It really depends on your understanding, your context and what you're trying to achieve and how it all fits together. Um, there we go. Um, and I suppose it's that context that's really important because what you there isn't a one size fits all single answer um, to retrofit. It's not that we're going to just roll out exactly the same set of measures or specification across every single house in the country because all of our houses are quite different. So uh, we've got probably especially in Cumbria, definitely especially in the northwest of England, we've got quite a lot of uh, buildings that are 18th, 19th century, um, quite a lot that are mid-century and then probably fewer um, that are newer. Hopefully the newer ones will need less retrofit, though that's not always the case. It can be quite frightening to see how much energy some newer buildings use. But the approach that you take, for example, in a stone-built <clears throat> cottage from the 19th century might be quite different to the approach that you take in a, a, a mid-century cavity wall house um, that it's relatively straightforward to do certain things in but less straightforward to do others. Um, and this is partly to do with the, uh, the way that we build buildings has changed over the last couple of hundred years um before kind of before the first world war roughly but it varies a bit uh we were building homes that were fueled mostly by coal fires that draw a lot of air through um and mostly using materials that were we've got breathable in quote marks there because it can be a bit confusing that doesn't actually have anything to do with air it's to do with moisture so we'd normally say breathable ref is a word that I'm a little bit uh, trying to avoid using. The, the kind of proper term for that would probably be vapor open or hygroscopic, if you're gonna be more scientific about it. But breathable is the term that everyone seems to use. But that, that's, you know, your, your lime mortars, your stone, um, your kind of softer bricks that moisture kind of comes into and out of, so uh, they can take on and release moisture more easily and buildings that don't really have much in the way of kind of impermeable membranes or uh, damp proof courses that kind of thing and that's versus modern homes that 
have got central heating rather than fires generally, double glazing, draft proofing, damp proof courses, lots of membranes and vapor barriers that are about rather than absorbing and releasing moisture, it's mostly about trying to keep moisture out altogether. Um, the difficulty that we have, or what makes it, I guess, more interesting uh, in some ways, is that a lot of our older homes have now been changed to be a bit more like our newer homes. So houses that were single glazed and really drafty, people have probably, and, and had coal fires in, they've probably put gas central heating in, they've put double glazing in. Uh, and sometimes that, even just doing those things, can start to cause problems because that moisture's got nowhere to go anymore. Um, <clears throat> but it's just being aware um, of that, and that can affect uh, the measures that you want to do, but it can also affect the materials that you might use in your retrofit as well. So often when we're looking at uh, older buildings, we try and look at materials that were a bit more sympathetic to that original kind of approach to vapor management and moisture management. Um, so we have a little bit of a knowledge check. Um, if you are able to put into the chat so that we can see it, uh, if you're able to describe what, what does it mean to take a whole house approach to retrofit, if you don't hit send, if you just type in what your thoughts are on that, don't hit send until I say so, and I'll give you uh, about 30 seconds to do that. Um, hopefully it all starting to make sense. Uh, as I say, you, you probably didn't expect that uh, we've got about 15 seconds left. Um, <clears throat> Everyone thinks houses are really simple, but as soon as you put all those different materials and systems together with people, it's no longer very simple. Uh, yeah, so if you could all hit send now, and we'll see, see what you've come up with. Yeah, so there's a lot of people talking about house as a system, um thinking about all those different parts of it the fabric the heating the weather climate uh don't do changes without thinking about everything else which is quite like that sounds quite grand and quite a challenge but once you've kind of got your head around it it becomes a bit easier and understanding the context absolutely um <clears throat> yeah no i think you've all uh all got it that's brilliant thank you everyone So, um, unless anyone has, are there any questions in the Q and A, Tina, that it would be appropriate to pick up now, or are they safe to wait? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> yeah, no questions in the Q and A yet, so that's fine. I just just carry on through. But yeah, if anyone does have a a, a question need answering immediately for understanding, then you know, do just put it in. Um, I'll look out for it. But otherwise, um, I'll assume that you're, you know, you can start writing questions in there now for later um, and we'll pick them all up at the end. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, the um, <clears throat> the biggest thing that uh, the biggest driver often behind retrofit is better control of, of heat um, in, in buildings. In our climate, it's usually about trying to keep the heat in. In some other climates, it's about trying to keep the heat out. Um, so the next little section is really just talking about that in a bit more depth. Um, so often what you're trying to do is reduce heat loss. Uh, these are some graphics from the, the tool that we use, the New Home Retrofit Planner. Um, and they describe heat loss in watts per degree Kelvin, uh, which I won't go into a huge amount of depth right now, but just so you can see that from different elements of the building, you tend to get different levels of heat heat loss, that's to do with what they're made out of and, and how big or much of an insulative value that has and the areas of those building, uh, of those elements. Uh, you usually find in most houses the biggest heat loss if they've not been insulated previously would be the roof, but often uh, the roof of the loft, but often in houses as they are now, people have put 
in a bit of loft insulation and that's where we're getting to the point where some of these more complex retrofit measures are coming in. Um, so often now it's it's walls and the floor and if you've got double glazing, maybe if it's very old double glazing, maybe that's part of it. But the aim is really to reduce heat loss <clears throat> and to reduce what the, the technical term for it is the heat transfer coefficient. So it's just the amount of heat that is traveling out through your building fabric um, and being taken out through drafts uh, and ventilation as well. Um, but the thing is, you're not just thinking about all your heat losses because in every house, as we've discussed, it's a system. Uh, there are different elements to it and there are also gains. So again, this is a graph that's showing You've got your losses, which are on the negative side of the graph. So you've got losses through your fabric. So that's just heat being conducted out through walls and floors and roof. Um, and then you've got ventilation and infiltration losses. And infiltration is literally just drafts. So it's where you've got a crack in the building where air is being lost out through that um, and it's taking heat with it and ventilation often take some heat with it even with a, a heat recovery system you'll lose a little bit of heat through your ventilation system but obviously you want fresh air so that's not necessarily such a bad thing so you've got those losses but you've then also got on the the other side of the equation the other uh side of the balance sheet uh you've got gains um you have internal gains which are mostly from people or pets uh, I think someone somewhere had done a calculation to see how many cats it would take to heat a passive house. And, um, or, well, people are about 100 watts. I'm not quite, can't remember what a cat was. Um, and then the other part of internal gains is from your appliances. So one of the slight ironies of energy efficiency work is that replacing old fridges and replacing old light bulbs very slightly increases the amount of heat you need to put in to keep a house more comfortable. Um, and so from things like cooking, fridges and freezers, people, pets, that's your internal gains. So that's just from the house being lived in. And then you've got solar gains as well, which in this house, they look fairly chunky. It varies hugely from house to house, depending on which way it faces. If the house faces entirely north, you're not going to get much in the way of solar gains because you're never going to get uh, that sun into the house. Um, and it also depends on the type of glazing that you've got. So as you improve your glazing system, your solar gains will probably go down a bit uh, because more uh, heat is able to pass through single glazing than it is through double or triple glazing usually. Um, so that's that's your balance. Um, and what that results in on this graph, the top of the, the red thing, that's the last bit that you need to top up. And that's your space heating requirement. So that's how much energy does your heating system need to put in to keep your house at a comfortable level. And in the UK at the moment, the average works out i think it's maybe slightly less than that now but it's it's around about 130 or 140 kilowatt hours per meter square per year so if you've got a 100 square meter house uh it'll take 14,000 uh kilowatt hours a year to keep it warm at that level of efficiency over the last 20 years we have been making things slightly better in the buildings that we've been building hopefully mostly sometimes only in theory uh, but the building regulations have changed over that time so we're now probably at the level where a new build house is 65 kilowatt hours in 2006 it might get slightly better with the the new regs but you're around about that that level kind of 50 60 kilowatt hours uh, the association of environmentally conscious building which some of you might have come across they're a really uh, interesting uh, and very active uh, group of different professionals involved in environmental building. They've published a retrofit standard that ends for 50 kilowatt hours. <coughs> Their new build standard is at 40 kilowatt hours. And then you've got Enerfit and Passive House, which are Passive House is pretty much the, the gold standard 
uh, of where you can get to. It's not always possible um, in retrofit, so they have a slightly relaxed standard for retrofit, which is not quite double uh, what they recommend for new build. But you can see what from going from the current UK average down to a passive house, we're talking about a serious reduction in the amount of energy that's needed. Even if you're going for the retrofit, uh, the ACB retrofit standard um, as a kind of reasonable benchmark, you're talking about a kind of two thirds, just less than two thirds reduction in the amount of heat that you need. And that requires a fair amount of, of insulation and air tightness work. Um, your space heating demand though, it's not just affected by insulation and air tightness, it's also affected by the shape of your house. Um, really because it's to do with the proportion of what your floor area is to what your heat loss area is. If you live in a mid-floor flat, so you've only got maybe two or three exposed external walls, but a reasonable size flat, um, then you're going to lose less heat than in a bungalow, which all of the all of your living spaces have contact with the ground. They've all got a roof. They're, you're losing heat from everywhere, really. So that is described as the form factor. Um, so it's not something that you can necessarily do much about in retrofit. Um, unless you're building an extension or, or something that allows you to, to change the form factor a little bit. But it's useful to be aware of because it can inform what reasonable targets might be for your home. Generally, we would say that for a bungalow, uh, it's reasonable to be slightly more relaxed about the space heating demand target that you're aiming for versus in a flat, because it should be easier to get to a higher standard in a flat because you've got fewer walls that you have to treat and maybe not even a roof or a floor at all. Um, yeah. <clears throat> the other really key, so that's space heating demand. The other really key uh, kind of metric that we use when looking at heat is the peak heating demand. Um, so this is the, rather than it being an average of energy over a total year. This is a kind of power, the rate of heat, the, the rate of, uh, it's measured in watts. So it's, you know, joules per second that you need to put into a building uh, to keep it at a comfortable temperature. And you work that out for the worst case condition, because you have to assume that maybe you come home one day, it's been cloudy, it's a cold winter's day and you need the house to be comfortable. And this is used to size heating systems because when you're, you're sizing systems, same as the way that they size the national grid, you're sizing to the peak. So it's like, what, what capacity do you, do you need to be able to meet that peak? Um, and that's really important for individual houses because it'll inform things like how big a heat pump you might need. Um, but it will also, it has an impact on the overall grid. So it's, it's things, this kind of figure that informs the district network operators when they're looking at how they might have to strengthen a bit of the grid if they understand like how much people's heating is going to come on on a winter evening and how much power that will need that they will need to supply. Um, in terms of what's possible in retrofit, these, this is modelled figures uh, from a report that you can have a look at. Um, well, modelled and actual figures that we monitored uh, for a group of houses that we did retrofits on. It's getting on for about eight years ago now. Um, but I suppose it's just to reassure you that like significant improvements are possible and none of these are passive houses. Uh, they all had, they weren't cheap to do, but they weren't hundreds of thousands of pounds either. We were talking kind of between 20 and 50,000 pounds roughly as a budget, all different types of houses. Um, and in general, across that whole scheme, we were able to get to uh, about a 50% reduction in actual 
uh, gas use. Um, so it was it was pretty. Uh, yeah, there was a fair bit of work involved. We did external wall insulation. We replaced a lot of windows, so not necessarily all windows, depending on their existing condition. Did a fair bit of air tightness work. Um, but yeah, it's possible to make quite a big difference, I suppose. Um, though having said that, uh, it's really worth being aware of uh, what we call the building performance gap. So this is the difference between what is predicted at design stage or sometimes what your energy performance certificate says you should use or are using and what you actually end up using. Um, this is one of the things that uh, standards like Passive House are really good at tackling. Um, so it's not with them not necessarily just about the uh, actual targets they're aiming for, they have a whole kind of quality management system around it, which means that the assumptions that are made at design stage, they're quite conservative about them and they, they follow it all through and make sure that what you've assumed at design stage is what actually gets built. Um, it's possible to do that without necessarily going for the full passive house. It's really just about making the right kind of assumptions at design stage and in your modeling, uh, paying attention to detailed design, making sure that the designs that you've come up with are actually buildable, then making sure that the, what gets built on site is actually what you've designed. Commissioning and handover is really important, especially for ventilation and heating systems. So making sure a very, very simple one that um, I think hopefully a few of you are aware of, but quite often uh, gas combi condensing boilers are sometimes fitted and just left at the manufacturer's settings. So they're left to run at a floor temperature of 82 degrees. Even though they're all nominally condensing, no boiler will condense at a floor temperature of 82 degrees. Really the installer should be changing that setting and making sure it's at a floor temperature, which means that it suits the house and suits the, the radiators in the house, so it'll keep the house warm, uh, but is also a, a floor temperature that will condense, which usually is, is something less than 60 degrees, maybe closer to, to 50 degrees. Um, there's a few things, guides and things floating around. That is something that any of you have got a combi boiler, you might want to just go and check that tonight, uh, see what your floor temperature is. And then yeah, it's about making sure that it continues to perform well, so maintaining things while they're in use. Uh, a wall with a leaking gutter on it, uh, that means all the stonework or the brickwork's getting wet, is going to have a worse U value than a drywall. Um, Okay. Um, there's a whole other thing I could go into it about EPCs, but I won't right now. Um, one of the things that can really help in this as well is by aiming low in the first place. So as I say, you maybe not necessarily going to be able to get to passive house, but the more work you do on the fabric to reduce your overall heating demand, if it then ends up being up or down on that by 10 or, or 20%, if it's 10 or 20% of something that is approaching uh, zero, or at least a very small number, that's less of a worry than 10 or 20% on a, a much bigger number. So, uh, another quick uh, knowledge check. Uh, are you able to each type into the chat uh, with an answer to the question, what does space heating demand mean? Uh, and again, if you pause, don't hit send until I say so. But yeah, if you can each put the definition of what you understand space heating demand to me. I think it, it looks like, I'll give you another 15 seconds on that. But Tina, it looks like we've got about four questions in the Q&A, or any of those clarification ones? Or... You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, mostly general ones. I think we can take at the end. Um, cool. All about sort of specific houses or situations. So yeah. Okay. Take those at the end. Yes. Yeah. If you all hit send on that now, 
on the Ah, uh, There is one question that we could actually answer now, if I can just go down to it. Yeah. Actually, that might be in the chat. Let me just check. Yeah, I think you've all uh, pretty much understood it. Um, yeah, to maintain the required temperature. Uh, it's the amount of energy, the amount of heat you need to put into a building to maintain a comfortable temperature. It's normally, um, normally normalised. Uh, the reason it's kilowatt hours per square metre that allows you to compare different buildings of a different size against each other so it's it's useful uh, in that way because it allows you to benchmark but if you just had the total kilowatt hours that would still be the the space heating demand it would just be the the absolute number for that house great okay i will crack on um thinking about heat and comfort um obviously there are different uh comfort levels that people are happy living at uh, some people are happier cooler than others but general recommended minimum is 18 degrees that's what's considered healthy uh in occupied rooms by public health england so that's worth bearing in mind when you're thinking about uh, your retrofit especially if at the moment that's not a temperature you're living at and it might be something that results in a bit of a performance gap in terms of your energy use if you were just compare uh, your bills now against uh, retrofit bills in your house in future. But uh, if you're living with a comfort gap at the moment, that would uh, retrofit measures should enable you to be a bit more comfortable, even if it means that you don't save as much on your bills. Uh, it's useful to think about kind of warmth and comfort um, and how humans perceive that. Uh, because it's it's not totally straightforward. It's it's affected by air temperature and relative humidity and air velocity. You always feel like slightly less comfortable in a draft in the middle of winter, although in the middle of the summer, a cooling breeze can be quite nice. And the big one is radiated heat as well. So we're really good at um, sensing radiant temperature, um, and that's comes from all of the surfaces around you. So it's not just about sitting in front of a fire, it's like all of the surfaces around you are giving off radiant heat. And if there's a big contrast between one and another, that will affect your comfort. Um, and all of those things are affected by the different transfer mechanisms. So in a house, you'll get radiative heat from radiators, but also from some solar gain. Um, and conduction and convection in the context of a house, conduction is heat just going out through the walls or the fabric, convection is often drafts. Uh, yeah, really good way of, of visualizing radiant temperature is, uh, is heat cameras. But yeah, the radiant temperature is the temperature that you uh, are sensing radiation from the surfaces around you at. The air temperature is the temperature of the air um obviously uh, but the two can be quite different from each other in the same space and that can be what leads to a degree of discomfort um it's one of the reasons that people are quite keen on triple glazing it doesn't necessarily save you huge amounts of energy though it does save some energy versus double glazing but what it does mean is that the surface temperature of that glass is much more comfortable and much closer to the other surfaces of the room around you um, then with double glazing where the surface temperature tends to feel a bit lower and you'll almost feel a little bit of a chill which isn't like a draft it's just a bit of a bit of a chill um, so we think about how we improve comfort uh, and the really key thing is with insulation because it re reduces conduction through the building fabric so you're keeping heat in better but the other thing it's doing is it's raising surface temperatures so that starts to feel a lot more comfortable um, and especially if you do it in a fashion that's relatively um, consistent across the space or across a house it should further improve that comfort it's one of the reasons why just insulating one wall and not another can sometimes cause issues because then you get a contrast between those walls it can be a bit uncomfortable uh, we use lots of different insulating materials. I know there's another session on this that I'm sure you'd have 
access to. Um, but internal, external, we use wood fibre, mineral wool, uh, mostly, uh, but lots of other materials as well. Basically, anything that traps a small amount of air is usually a really good insulating material. Um, it does also help, uh, insulation helps improve. Sorry, Tina, I can hear like a, oh, sorry, you might need to, no, no, it's all right. Um, thinking about comfort in summer, I know in Cumbria it's, you know, it's rare that we get a super hot day, but thinking about that is really important. Insulation can help uh, reduce overheating in summer, alongside thinking about um, where your windows are, how much glazing you've got, shading uh, and ventilation as well. But uh, so it's important just to think about summer conditions for that one day in July that we get hot weather. I think we've been, oh yes, yeah, so talking about convection. So this is your drafts, basically. Drafts and thermal bypass, chimney effects uh, and ventilation. We can't avoid having ventilation, we need it uh, for good indoor air quality, but there's ways of doing it that make it comfortable as well. Uh, drafts, I think everyone probably understands, that's just where you have a crack or a, a gap in the building fabric and you get air movement through it that you maybe don't want. Uh, thermal bypass is a bit of a tricky one, I suppose, might, might not be immediately obvious, but if you've got an insulated material and then you've got air moving either within it or alongside it, that increases the amount of uh, convective heat loss. So if you fit insulation with loads of gaps in it, the effectiveness of that insulation is going to be much reduced. Or if you fit insulation and it's a fiber material, but you don't have any air barrier or wind barrier, so the wind can just blow through your insulation material, it's going to be a lot less effective than it would be otherwise. Um, it's about a, well, it depends on the context, but there have been studies that have been done that suggest that it can reduce uh, the effectiveness of the insulation by kind of 20 to 30 percent. So it's worth fitting insulation well and avoiding this where you can. And then there are things like chimney effects, which uh, you get both in chimneys, but also in cavity walls. Uh, so if you've got a cavity party wall and there's air moving up um, between the leaves of brickwork, then you're going to be losing heat to that cavity, which then just escapes out, out of the top of the wall. Um, if you were to just cap that, it very much helps reduce it. If you fill it, probably even more so. I think a really, really key thing to understand is the difference between infiltration and, and ventilation. So infiltration is unplanned air movement uh, through gaps in the building structure, basically that leads to drafts, heat loss. Um, the really big problem it can cause is that if that crack or, or gap is in a place where you don't really want it to be, uh, especially if it's in a bathroom or a kitchen and you've got warm, wet air moving through your building structure and the risk of it hitting a cold part of the structure and condensing and causing problems. So infiltration is kind of what you don't want. Uh, ventilation, you definitely do want. That's planned so it's about having an exchange of air with the external environment that brings fresh air in and gets rid of pollutants um, and it helps to moderate temperatures so especially if you do nighttime cooling it will um, yeah help to keep you cooler but you know you'll know yourselves from if you're cooking or if you've had a shower you need to get that uh, water vapor those cooking smells out the house and the way to do that is through ventilation which is planned and therefore effective uh, whereas infiltration is a lot more hit and miss um i think it's just a, a neat illustration of where you might get different levels of infiltration and it's a maddeningly maddeningly large number of different places in the house where you can end up with unplanned drafts gaps cracks uh, when we measure leakiness, uh, this is uh, my friend Gervais, who's doing a, an air pressure test on a house, so if you might have seen this, uh, you fit a fan to a door and basically measure how fast the fan has to go to maintain the pressure in the house. 
average existing house is uh, measuring air permeability under UK building regs. So it's the number of meters cubed of air that's leaking through the building fabric per meter square at 50 pascals. Um, I'll have to update the building regs one because it's coming down slightly on that, but it's still uh, 10 meters cubed of air leaking through your building fabric at 50 pascals every hour. Um, you'll see it goes right the way down to passive house, which is less than uh, one. So it's, it's quite a big difference between even a, a building regs new build house um, and a passive house. And you can tackle it in existing houses in lots of different ways. This is uh, making sure that your gaps between your floorboards are filled, making sure that your windows are well taped to your walls. Uh, the one photo down there that might be a bit harder to see, that's a floor joist going into an external wall. Um, so it's been taped up around so that you don't get gaps from your um, gaps against your floor joist where air can leak out at first floor level. Uh, so, quick knowledge check. Uh, would everyone be able to say what the difference is between infiltration and ventilation in the chat? And I'll give you 20 seconds for this one. I think there's a whole other session on ventilation. Uh, as well, and it gets it becomes quite a complicated subject because there's lots of different systems available and lots of ways of doing things, so the fundamentals don't change. Yeah, if you all hit send on your comment now. Yeah, brilliant. So I think the last one, yeah, infiltration, unplanned air movement, ventilation is planned. Many of you will also know as well but uh, you'll, you'll notice it, the couple of storms we had uh, a few weeks back. If you have lots of infiltration, your house will be a lot, lot colder on a stormy night, um, just because that, the wind acting on the outside of the house is gonna cool you down a lot. Whereas ventilation is planned air movement that gets you to your good level of indoor air quality. Okay, brilliant, thank you everyone. Um, so, We've got the last little section after this, uh, which is a really important one and one that is very difficult to avoid, especially in uh, places like where I grew up in, in Workington. Uh, you're not getting away from moisture there at all. Um, and it's important to understand that there is a relationship between moisture and heat, which is really obvious. If you heat something up, normally it dries out. Uh, And the moisture flows within a house are exactly the same in that they are affected by heat and they affect heat themselves. So a wet wall will conduct a lot more heat because water is quite a good conductor of heat. A wet wall will conduct more heat than a dry wall. So you want to try as very first thing that you're doing when you're looking at improving your house to make sure that all your walls are dry. Um, there's a really useful video that's been created by the UK Centre for Moisture in Buildings um, that I'd recommend you all have a look at, but it talks about the different mechanisms that create moisture in the home. And some of it comes from the external environment or just the, the context of the house. Um, you know, if you're in a place like Cumber, it's, it's generally quite humid. Or you get a lot of precipitation, you get a lot of rain, you might get a lot of moisture from the ground, depending on where your house is in relation to the, the water table and other things. But then we also generate a lot of moisture in our houses as well from cooking and washing and showering. Um, and that's kind of unavoidable if we all want to kind of cook our tea and stay clean. Um, hang on a sec. And obviously what we're trying to do is avoid getting moisture into our building fabric um, because it'll, it can have effects like this, which is bad for our health. So this is mould in a, a flat in Manchester. It's appeared in this section of the building because um, 
I think there was a cold spot there. It turned out there was maybe a leaking gutter as well. So the well was kind of damp. Therefore, it was colder. The fat wasn't massively well ventilated. So moisture was condensing there and then that promoted mold growth. Um, and mold isn't good for anyone's health at all. So what we're trying to do is make buildings that are more energy efficient, but also healthier for us to live in. So that we're kind of trying to avoid this. Um, you can tackle that by fixing leaks. But in this case, what we also recommended was improving the ventilation system so that it removed more of the moisture from the air. So there was less moisture available to condense on the wall. Uh, and it, I think it pretty much did solve it in the end. And yeah, the famous Colin King quote that any retrofit project that does not consider ventilation is a condensation project. So if you're sealing up a house, making it more airtight, getting rid of your ventil infiltration, although in some houses where there's a lot of infiltration, you can still get condensation and mold problems. Uh, but if you're doing that, um, then you really do need to think about where your fresh air is going to come from. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm in a sec. But you're also thinking about where moisture is coming from in the fabric. Um, so the graphics here are a kind of typical Victorian brick wall, which assuming, you know, they, they had maybe slits as um, DPC or sometimes in the late Victorian era they put in um, bitumen um, but the wall is in contact with the ground and the ground's often got moisture in so sometimes moisture will be getting up and into the wall it's getting rained on uh, so there's moisture coming from there there's also moisture coming from inside although some of that won't track all the way into the wall because there's often plaster there if you were to add insulation to that that was completely impermeable so stopped all the moisture moving altogether was a, a kind of foam based insulin plastic type thing and then any moisture that was getting into the wall uh, it can cause problems because it's got nowhere for that moisture to dry out to so you end up with moisture trapped behind the insulation if you're using something that is a breathing insulation or a vapor open insulation system it means that that moisture is more able to transpire out from the wall um, yeah, there's a whole article there that the, the text is a little bit fuzzy, but it's it's worth a look on those issues. Um, and yeah, just to reinforce that when we when people talk about breathability in buildings, um, generally they're not talking about air. So don't get it. You can have a very, very airtight, but vapor permeable building. Yeah, the way I sort of tend to try and visualize that is that the the t water molecules are smaller than air molecules so yeah. actually they can wriggle through your building fabric if you've got a lime mortar or something that allows these little moisture molecules um to get through but the bigger air ones um actually can't so that's that's why i suppose and it's yeah really no, counterintuitive it. isn't it i really <laughs> want water moving through the building to be bigger than the air that's moving through the building but it's the other way around <laughs> yeah and, and there's different mechanisms for that that different materials will perform in a different way they have different levels of how open they are or how they transport moisture um, and that's where things like limes or uh, wood fiber uh, or you know hemp type uh, products they're often more able to transport moisture whereas uh, things like uh, plastic forms are basically just moisture will just sit against them and not move anywhere so it's it's the kind of movement of moisture that we're interested in because uh, we want things to be able to dry out basically um and then yeah there's lots of uh when it comes to ventilation pull of the session section on this but there's lots of different ventilation systems available um what most people probably have in their houses at the moment is either opening windows or the odd trickle vent in a window and an intermittent fan in your bathroom and kitchen so it just comes on for a few minutes while you need it and it will click off again but there are what we tend to recommend are um, more constant 
lower level but constant ventilation system so you're always moving the air um but yeah there's a million and one different ways of doing it which can be quite confusing only four systems in the building rigs but they don't cover everything um yeah i think we should probably wrap up there because we're uh yeah five minutes over where i said it would be but no, that's absolutely fine, Marianne. So thank you so much. That was really clear and really, really interesting and really helpful. Um, as I'm just going to wrap up really quickly now, um, if, if you have questions that come to mind that haven't been answered, then do look up out for our, our previous webinars, which are on YouTube, and our future webinars, which are on the CAFS events page. We will have more after Easter, so keep your eyes open for those. Um, you can um, ask, ring us up for an advice call with the CAFS Energy Advisor, or if you're thinking about whole house retrofit, you can um, phone up and ask about retrofit specifically, in which case you'll get a, a phone call with me um, just to get you started. Or you can ask us for a quote about our full energy advice audit, the home retrofit planner. So those are the contact details. And we'll be sending this out the, the the recording will come out in a couple of days time by email to all of you and i think a copy of um marianne's slides as well so you will have this information coming out to you in terms of those are future webinars um you can you see we've got a couple on windows choosing and installing windows coming up at the end of march and new ones in the spring as well so do look out for those um, also, for those of you who aren't already aware, we've set up a Cumbria Green Build Facebook page, which is where any of you can post questions and answer each other's questions, or we might jump in and answer some questions. So there's a possibility there to sort of share information with others who are looking at retrofit. Um, so wrapping up now, I think we're running a moment or two late perhaps, but please, um, if you haven't already done so, sign up for the CAF's newsletter. That's where we'll send out a monthly newsletter and we always put in there if we've got new webinars or anything else that might be useful, might be of interest to you. Obviously come and join another webinar. Do complete our survey that we will include the link to that in the email that's going to come out after this webinar in the next day or so and contact us if you'd like more advice. Thank you to everyone who's donated and most of all I'd like to say thank you to Marianne and for a wonderful presentation and thank you to all of you who put in questions and came along to this webinar and hope to see you again soon.